name is Nick Gauthier, and I'm here to talk about your test suite. Um, so just to kick things off, I just want to ask, how many of you wish that your test suite ran faster? There we go. That's almost everybody. Some people didn't raise their hands, so I'm just going to rephrase that. How many of you are very happy with how fast it runs and don't want it to go any faster? It's infinitely fast. I don't know. There you go. Okay, so some of you with the, the, with the divide by zero infinite test suite. Uh, test suite. All right, so continuous integration is great. Um, working, testing, and then committing tested code always works real nice. The problem is when we're working for 30 minutes and then our tests take 30 minutes, it's just not really a, a very efficient process. So a lot of people at that point are like, hey, let's build a CI server to run our tests for us. Now, CI servers are useful for replicating production environments, but this usually ends up just getting you out of sync with your actual testing process. So your feedback loop is still 30, 40 minutes behind. Some people have told me that their feedback loop is a day behind. Uh, and that can really cut into your productivity. So instead of that, let's make our tests faster. Um, so I'm going to talk about the project. Um, the project is a real production project. It has been running for a couple of months now. Um, it is for a large company. This is real code doing real stuff. You're not going to see any synthetic benchmarks here. It's running on Rails. Um, I've heard a couple people say, oh, no, 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 the Rails guy here. Um, of course, for, for all intents and purposes of this talk, Rails is just a large Ruby application. I'm not actually going to show anything that's specific to Rails. I'm barely even going to show stuff that's specific to Ruby. Uh, a lot of this stuff applies all the way down to the kernel layer and, uh, and file systems. Um, we are using Factory Girl. Factory Girl is awesome for uh, building up objects. Um, we're using Shudo, which is a layer on top of test unit. But the stuff I'm going to talk about applies to test unit, Shudo, RSpec, um, Cucumber, uh, even JSLint. Um, we're using Paperclip for uh, images on our site. It's a really great, great tool. And uh, we do something called MTDB testing. Uh, what that means is that when we load up our test environment, we don't have fixtures. We have an empty database, and all of our tests are responsible for creating their own scenario in which to run, testing inside that scenario, and then tearing it back down. So uh, just to start things off, I am going to be showing a lot of benchmarks, so I thought I would let you know what I was running this on. Uh, it was a 2.4 gigahertz quad-core machine, 4 gigs of RAM, and a standard flat earth hard disk. Um, I actually did all these benchmarks in one day on one git commit by rolling up all the little tips and things that I had. So these are actually um, pretty solid. It's not like I did them over a course of a couple of months as the code was changing. These are the right stats. It's not a huge project. Um, we did it in about two months. So we've got 4,000 lines of tests and uh, 3,000 lines of code. Um, so just to give you an idea, if you wanted to benchmark your own test suite and you had you know, 8,000 lines of code, you could look at mine, double it, see about where I'm at versus where you're at. OK, so the vanilla test suite. This is before I really did anything to it. This is where we were saying, hey, maybe we should have a CI server. And I said, hey, you know, maybe we should just speed up our tests. It was taking um, 13 minutes and uh, 15 seconds. So at this point, I'm going to ask you guys to participate a little bit more. We're going to play The Price is Right. Um, as I go through this presentation, we're going to be knocking that test suite number down. And what I want you guys to do now is think about how fast you think I can get this test suite to run. So think of a number, write it down. If you really want it set in stone, uh, tweet it, and then later on you can see how good your prediction was, right? Or post it in the back channel, something like that. Really think about it. Each time we get a new number, we'll see who's still left. Okay? So, yeah. How many tests run? Uh, how many total tests? I'm not sure exactly. I think we had, I think we had near a thousand assertions, but I, I, I don't remember. Sorry. Um, so okay. So at this point, everyone should have guessed something that was lower than 13 minutes and 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Is any, did anyone get knocked out already? <laughs> okay. All right. I figure I might as well go for low-hanging fruit right first, right? Okay. So fast context. Um, fast context is for contexts in Shuda. Um, in this case, we have a context that has a setup, and then we have two should blocks that run inside that context. Both of those should blocks, both assertions, uh, are run after that setup is run. So this is also uh, a lot like before all for RSpec um, and uh, before blocks in Cucumber. So the idea is that you're setting up some stuff, you're doing some tests, then you set it up again, you do your other tests. So all you have to do with fast context is you drop it right on the front there and say fast context. And this is all you have to do. What this becomes equivalent to is this, which is where the should, uh, the setup 
goes first, and then both assertions run only after running the setup once. Okay? So in this case, I've saved doing that setup twice, because I only had to do the setup one time to do my two assertions. So, uh, big warning on this one, you must have side effect free should blocks. That's just a good practice in general. Do your work in your setup and check it out in your should block with assertions. Don't necessarily uh, do any work in those assertion sections. And then that means you could even just alias context to fast context, and you should be okay. Um, this is really the only big warning that I've gotten so far, because this does kind of change how your tests work. Um, but if you've got side effect free should blocks, then uh, you should not have a change to your coverage. Um, okay, so that was a quick one, real easy. Um, I mean, you do have to go through your files one at a time, flip that around. But let's see what we get. Okay, so I'm down to five minutes and 32 seconds by combining app. The reason for this is we have a lot of heavy functional tests. So functional tests, you have a get uh, for, let's say, the index, and then you have like five assertions, like I got a bunch of users, there's a bunch of these tags in my view, um, it set up this stuff, it queried that stuff, maybe it posted, like uh, destroyed something here or there. So by combining that pretty heavy get request into one task, uh, uh, one test with a bunch of assertions, we're able to save a lot of time. So at this point, who's still playing the game? Who have I still got? Good, okay. Don't want it to be too easy. Here's pretty bad. It'll get prettier. So can we do better? Um, yeah, I've only been here for about 10 minutes, so let's hope so. Um, all right, so paperclip. Let's talk about paperclip a little bit. Paperclip calls image magic. Image magic is awesome, it's powerful, it's incredibly useful, but like many powerful, incredibly useful things, image magic is slow. So. Uh, when you ask for the geometry from a file to see what its dimensions are, Paperclip actually shells out to the identify command to identify that file. So not only are you running image magic, but you're shelling to it. When you make a thumbnail, you're shelling out to the convert command. So as we're running these tests, we've got some models that require images on them, and we're creating all these images all the time. Um, there was a great talk yesterday by Man Gupta about debugging uh, perf tools. Uh, was one of the ways that I found this issue uh, is by looking at where time is being taken uh, in the test suite and uh, it really keyed me into that solution. So if you didn't see his talk yesterday, definitely check out that video. Um, so I made a little mock monkey patch thing I called Quaker Clip. It just says if you want to know the dimension of a file, it's 100 by 100. When you want to make a thumbnail, I'm going to copy my fixture file where you expect it to be. So you even have a real thumbnail there. Um, and it's a real file on the file system, but you don't actually have to run it command. So, a little mock, uh, also very simple, and the results. Uh, three minutes and 34 seconds. So, who's still here? Good, good, because that was the easy stuff. That was the, oh hey, this is slow, let's mock that out, whatever. Um, and uh, now we're going to get a little bit more hardcore. So, of course we can do better. That was only two rounds. Uh, I looked at my system usage graph. Um, this comes up in the toolbar in, uh, in Ubuntu. I love this little thing. This is my CPU usage during a test week run. Uh, I told you I did have a quad core machine, and uh, it's really not being utilized. One core is doing all of my testing, and three <laughs> cores are for me to use to goof off while my test week's running. And I do really love internet videos, but even those only need one core, so I can probably <laughs> switch this around, give them a little bit more of my, my processing power, and I can probably get by on one core on YouTube. So let's talk about multi-core testing. There are a lot of existing solutions. There's Parallel Specs, uh, Tickle, Deep Test, Specsure, and probably more that I've left off this list. Um, there are some downfalls that I found with a bunch of them. Uh, for example, Tickle, Parallel Specs, and Specsure, they pre-group your files. So they will take all 100 of your test files and say, hey, you've got four cores. I'm going to put 25 here, 25 here, 25 here, and 25 here. If you've got them in alphabetical order, guess what? All your Cucumber stuff is going on the first core and all your unit tests are going on the last core, right? It's not a very good balancing solution. It's not true about Spectre. Oh, it's not true about Spectre. Awesome, I will change that. Change. Good, that's great. Um, so uh, Tickle um, only does test unit. So for me, it was kind of like, okay, well, we've got test unit. What if we want to do some Cucumber stuff? What if we want to do RSpec? We're kind of stuck there. Um, parallel tests, which uh, I believe does RSpec, uh, it was local only. Uh, and it, it required a multiple database setup, which isn't that bad, but it's just one more thing to do. Um, oh, sorry, Specsure 
is, uh, is RSpec. So I kind of wanted something that was a lot more uh, robust and could do a lot more stuff. Um, yeah, so Spectrure used Bonjour for networking. Uh, so it's actually only over the LAN. So if you wanted to have a cloud computing solution, you'd have to like tunnel ports and stuff. And, uh, you also have to run a, a daemon on the server. Uh, this led me to deep test. Um, deep test by ThoughtWorks. Um, it uses sockets. It uses multiple databases. You run remote daemons. Uh, it has a very difficult setup and it's very powerful. Um, I was going to put the README on here, but it's like it's, the, it's this long on my screen. It's like that. It's huge. Um, but they use it extremely well. But um, I wanted to make something that was more useful for those of us who are doing this every day and don't need a big crazy system, but would like to have some power uh, available if we need it. So that's why I wrote Hydra. Um, Hydra does test unit, it does Cucumber, it does RSpec, and it will do JSLint. Um, I think Jasmine's probably going to be the next step there. It does active balancing. So after it's booted up all of the workers that it's going to be working with, it uh, sends out messages to those workers, gets the results back, sends out more tests, so it tries to balance that as much as it can. It will even learn from your test suite and record metrics on your test times and run the slow ones first to try and get your cores at the best balance that it possibly can. There's a simple setup. There are no sockets. Uh, there are no daemons that you have to run on the server. Um, this is how to use Hydra in your rake file. Uh, you'll see all this is is a task, and all I'm doing is adding my files in. This is one task that I added my unit, my functional, my integration, my features, my specs, and my JavaScript stuff. That's it, there's just one task. You just add it all in like this, and you can run Hydra on your system. At this point, it'll only run on one port, so you have to configure it. In this case, I have one local worker that has two runners, which means that I have uh, the worker corresponds to my computer, the runners correspond to my cores. So this is a dual core set. But still, three lines of YAML, a little bit of tasks here, and that's it, and you're going. Uh, one thing I want to talk about with uh, about uh, with environment loading. If you've ever looked at a uh, test unit um, or Cucumber, you'll see that they actually double boot your environment. Um, test unit, you can end up with four environment loads. You have one that boots up your Rails project, then it shells out to your unit tests, which boot your environment to run the unit tests, that which shell, and then it shells out to functional, and then it shells out to integration. So you get four environment loads. Cucumbers, well, it's kind of a bit, bit better, but since it doesn't have those three types of tests, it boots up your environment and then it shells out again. It does have a fork option though, which can help it. Um, our spec comes up, one environment load. Hydra has one environment load for all of your frameworks, so it will only boot your environment once, and then it will run unit tests, cucumber stuff, and our spec all within that same environment uh, without having to reboot your environment. So it does that by forking workers, so you get great copy on write memory savings, um, and, uh, and that's how you can not have to reboot your workers because the environment just gets copied along with it. So just a couple uh, warnings on this one. Um, you do need to have transactional tests, and you need to have independent tests. And what I mean by that is, this is a concurrent system. Can, two, can any two of your tests run any part of their testing at the same time as all the other ones? You need to be able to say yes. Uh, if you've got fixtures, if you have files in the database, or you have the same path coded into a bunch of tests, you'll end up uh, running into your own code while your tests are running. Um, but if you're using something like Factory Girl and, you're ha and you've got empty um, databases, then you just spin up whatever it is that you want to work with. You build a bunch of objects, you work with them, you do your tests, and then you tear them back down. Uh, yes? So this is all running on the same database? Yes, same database. Yep, so you don't even have to set up multiple databases because when Factory Grow builds different objects, they'll have different IDs. Um, so the results of going multi-core here, we're down to one minute and 26 seconds now on the quad core. So who is still with me? Good, good. There we go, it's getting smaller. Can we do better? Of course. Uh, this is what my system monitor looks like right now. Uh, up top is the CPU, and on the bottom is the hard disk. Um, anybody know what the red stuff is? Weight. The red stuff is I/O weight. So I was looking into file systems a little bit. Um, I'm running Linux, so I've got ext4. I looked at the journaling options. Uh, if you're running journal data, um, all the data will be committed into the journal before being written to the file system. This is a very safe um, and excellent way to run your production servers. Um, but there was another option called journal data writeback. 
here, um, data can uh, data may be written into the main file system after its metadata has been committed to the journal. Um, so that means that it can run, it can write some metadata into the journal saying, oh yeah, I'm going to write a file there or something or whatever, and then go back to your process and say we're good. And then whenever it feels like it, the kernel can flush some stuff to disk. Like it says, it, this may increase throughput. Uh, well, and it uh, may allow old data to appear in files after a crash. So it may increase throughput. Thumbs up, that's what we're here for. Old data after a crash. Ah, not my fixtures, right? I don't really care about that. If somebody pulls the power plug and I lose my test fixtures, that's fine with me. Don't try this in production. You never want to have to say, oh no, my credit card transactions. So please, this is for testing. Don't deploy this. Um, also, A time. Um, so the Linux, uh, the file system will record the access time when you read a file. That means that whenever you're uh, reading a file, you also have to write to that file. Um, and this is really poor in terms of performance, but it's still around because of old school mail clients like MUT, which record when you read something by using the access time on the file system. So there's no A time, which is don't update the access time. If you're using MUT, Please don't do this. If anyone here is not using MUT, this is a very nice way to uh, improve your, your file system performance. So here's where it was before, and then afterwards. So there's two things you'll notice here. The first one is that the red snow is, uh, is a lot less prominent. But also look at, the, look at the hard drive. See what the minimum amount of usage is across that uh, test suite time. Over here, we've got more gaps. We've got more times where we didn't really write anything, and then we just spiked a big write. That, was, that means that the kernel was able to go back to the process and say, your data is good, keep going. And the process could continue. Also, you'll notice that the, the average height of that blob is a lot higher over here because it's able to just keep that CPU busy the whole time. So data is not flushed. It's going to stay in the kernel's page memory. Uh, it's going to get flushed out when it's convenient. Um, this is as fast as a RAM disk. I tried it. I mounted the code base, the working directories, and the database itself purely in RAM, and I did not get a speed up outside of maybe a 2 or 3% amount of uh, error. This is as fast as a solid state disk. Um, my company actually bought me one to see if this would work. It didn't, but they let me keep it. <laughs> um, so you don't really need to drop all that money on it. Just do a couple of tweaks, and you're good. Um, however, SSDs are really awesome, and they make a lot of other stuff fast. So you should probably still buy them. Uh, so the results of doing these tweaks. Ah, uh, 50 seconds. So, who have I still got? Good. Uh, wait, hold on. Keep your hands up for a second. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, nine people. Okay. Can we do better? They're clapping. I'm not done yet. All right, Ruby Enterprise Edition. Um, the best way to do this is with RBM. I'm sure all you guys know about this at this point. RBM is awesome. Um, Ruby Enterprise Edition comes with TC Malloc. Uh, it's the fastest malloc we've seen, works particularly well with threads. So Hydra and Factory Girl, a lot of memory allocation. We're building up a lot of objects, tearing them back down. The database is working with all this new stuff, uh, allocating memory there too. There are a lot of threads and forks. I'm forking to run my test processes across those workers. So uh, in addition to TC malloc, we can do some garbage collection committee. These are Twitter settings. Um, they turn it up a bunch because with Rails, you actually need a lot more memory than with normal Ruby processes. So the Ruby garbage collector is tuned for small applications to get them going quick and use a small amount of RAM. If you're doing it with Rails, you get a whole bunch of allocations right off the bat. So the first thing you do, and the Twitter did, is they turned it up. My settings are anywhere between uh, 2 and 20 times greater than Twitter settings. I usually end up with a couple hundred megs of memory allocated when I boot my environment, and it only runs like once or twice. So I just give it a huge slab of RAM and just let it go. So the results of TC malloc for improved memory allocation and for garbage collection tuning. 18 seconds. Wow. Yeah. All right. Let's <laughs> see it. One, two, three people. How many of you have seen this talk before? Any cheaters? Oh, good, no cheaters. All right, who gets one second? No? Sometimes I get people who've seen the prices right. One guy. Oh, this works. <laughs> <laughs> I've played this game before. All right. 
18 seconds, not bad. 13 minutes, 15 seconds, down to 18 seconds. That's 44.17 times faster, which, when you multiply by 100, which makes it look bigger, is 4,400. I never touched my app code, not once. I didn't change my test coverage, assuming that you have side effect free contexts in the case of fast context, and that you're happy with mocking out image magic. But for all intents and purposes, I was still loading my pages. I'm still looking at that stuff. I'm still writing this stuff. I, I actually don't like to mock. I like my unit tests to hit the database. So these are all hitting the database. What if you're in 4,417% more this year? That's, that's a big number. Think about it in a different context, right? And you could buy a beer for everybody at the draft test last night. <laughs> All right, so I did want to show, I, I see so many of these around, I figured I'd toss this in. I had a, one of my coworkers on a MacBook Pro run this, 57 seconds. Um, and actually, it's a little bit faster now because of the garbage collection stuff that wasn't run at this time. But, uh, so it may be a little bit quicker, but I didn't want to just kind of fudge it. So, yes? What kind of database are you doing? Uh, in this case, it was Postgres. Oh, really? Yes. On the same server? Yes, uh, Postgres has a great option. Um, it lets you do uh, write back at Postgres level. So I have got write back going on the file system, but also in Postgres. So you can have a 200 millisecond write back window on it. So the performance is, uh, is excellent. So can we do better? Uh, yeah, but uh, it's kind of cheating. So um, uh, you guys win, the three of you that, that got it. We're going to stick with that. Uh, distributed Hydro. If you can SSH into another machine, let's say you've got another laptop sitting around, another computer, you can SSH in, you can run a test file, why can't it help? That's really the minimum requirement for having a computer help you out with running a test. So that's why I decided to make the minimum requirement for Hydro. I actually implemented its pipe messaging system that it does locally over SSH by just writing up and down the SSH connection. Um, so the co configuration gets a little bit more complicated. You'll see there's a local worker with four runners, and that's for um, the your machine. Then what you do is you add in an SSH worker, you tell it how to connect, and where your test code is, and how many runners to work with. Then there's a sync node that you can put in your YAML file that will just use rsync over the SSH connection to synchronize your directories so that it can copy the code over. And uh, actually, while it's copying the code over, it gets started locally on your tests. And by the time the remote worker boots up, it starts helping as quick as it can. So really simple. Uh, results, 18 seconds. So I didn't go anywhere. Um, and that's really just because there's a lot of overhead at this point. Um, I crunched the numbers, and it's about six or eight seconds of that 18 is rail booting, right? And how long does it take you to SSH into a machine? Maybe two seconds, right? The remote worker wasn't able to actually help a lot. So what I decided to do is get a different benchmark. I went to another project. We were having a lot of trouble getting this to be concurrent because it was using a more old school kind of fixture style way of testing. So we threw another box at it. Um, with one machine, it took 8 minutes and 47 seconds. We gave it another machine, 5.33, so it is faster. Um, there is a wiki page on Hydra of success stories. We've got people who showed they were able to use the distributed stuff to get 6, 7, 800% speed ups. Uh, obviously, you can just keep throwing machines at it. Um, so, uh, I wanted to end with this. Can you do better? Um, that's not a challenge. I think that's just more of a call to arms. Uh, I was really surprised that I was, that I was able to do this this well. Um, I found that a lot of the areas that I look into in, in Ruby and in Rails, somebody else has already done a better job. And so just the fact that I was able to actually do something kind of made me think, hey, we're not really trying very hard at this because I can't be this great at it, right? So I think there's a lot of stuff that we can do to make our test suites faster. And I think tightening that feedback, uh, that feedback loop is really going to help out with the quality uh, of our projects. So please try to make your test suites faster, bookmark this, and, uh, and come back to it. Um, so, any questions? Yeah. Would you speculate on how is, would, you, would it be worth doing with a single core machine? Uh, I would? Yes. Um, because it will immediately get rid of all of those environment loads. Um, so, I actually uh, created a Rails project where I had three tests. I had a unit test that asserted true, a functional test that asserted true, and an integration test that asserted true. And if you do that in just rate test, it took me 14 seconds. But when I did it with Hydra, with only one environment boot, it took me four seconds. So you can at least cut off the environment uh, using Hydra. And um, because people often have a lot of different frameworks, 
you'll have to like run the RSpec framework, and then that goes, and then it shuts down, and then it'll do the cucumber framework, whatever. You can run that all together in Hydra. Um, and, uh, and so that, that also gives you a bit of a boost. Although, honestly, Hydra's probably the more difficult of these solutions. So I definitely suggest that you start at the front of the presentation and work your way to the back. Um, anything else? Oh, I've just been cut off. If you want to talk, we can talk after.